Welcome everyone. So hi, welcome everyone to No Poetry, No Peace, a reading and celebration of National Poetry Month. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And this event was produced in collaboration with the San Francisco Writers Conference. Together, we strive to provide high quality learning experiences for writers at a low cost or free, usually free. Um, I'd like to thank those of you who elected to support this event and pay a little something to attend. It really does go a long way uh, in helping us do more in these challenging times. So thank you very much. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest designed to serve the public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Uh, we were founded in 1854. So right now, due to the pandemic, almost all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider joining with us it's only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this event tonight is titled after a published collection of poems by Cheryl B's Boutte and her daughter, Dr. Angela Boutte. However, we also have a host of other local poets who will be sharing their favorite pieces with us. Um, Cheryl will be moderating our experience tonight, so let me say a few words about her. Uh, Cheryl is a member of the Mechanics Institute who regularly shares her knowledge with our writers community. She is a multidisciplinary writer based in Oakland who aims to shine a light on the politics of race and economics through her narratives with vivid imagery and lyrical prose. And she's also an extremely genial and generous uh, person. Uh, her first novel, Betrayal on the Bayou, was published in June 2020. And No Poetry, No Peace was published in August 2020. As you'll soon find out, she is a skilled presenter, storyteller, and MC. And thank you so much for hosting this event, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, I just want to encourage our guests to use the chat space if they have any questions, and we aim to get to them at the end of the reading. I also will send all the registered guests a link to the event's video uh, in a couple of days. So we are recording this event, um, and I hope to get that up on our YouTube space uh, 48 hours or so. Sometimes it takes a little while to upload. Anyway, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Are we ready, Cheryl? Oh, we are ready, ready. Are we ready, poets? Yes, we ready. All Definitely. right. Thank you so much, Sharon. And thank you to the Mechanics Institute for hosting No Poetry, No Peace. And thank you for, to all the poets for being here with us tonight. I just want to say a couple of things about National Poetry Month. Inspired by the successes of Black History Month in February and Women's History Month in March, in 1996, the Academy of American Poets organized and introduced the annual April celebration of National Poetry Month. Each year, the Academy of American Poets commissions a special poster for National Poetry Month. This year, it features the words of Joy Harjo, National Poet Laureate. And I don't know if you can see it behind me, but what Joy says is, there is nowhere else I want to be but here. I lean into the rhythm of your heart to see where it will take us. So let's see where all of these wonderful poets will take us. This evening, I welcome a dazzling group of poets who will each share their poetic gifts with you. And as we say, no poetry, no peace. This evening, I want to start with my first poet, my co-author of No Poetry, No Peace, 
a biochemist, neuroscientist, poet, and my daughter, Angela Boutte. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mama. I really appreciate it. Thank you, group. Um, I really appreciate the support. Um, so I know that uh, we'll probably need room for questions uh, for a lot of people. So I decided to choose a couple of short but very happy, what I think are very happy poems. Um, and over the course of this past year, um, 2020, which was pretty much terrible for everyone, um, I decided to sit back and look at a few things that I was grateful for that I could basically just mock in daily life. Uh, this first poem is called Did. Kinked, curled, cut or straight. In this chair, I just wait, wait, wait. Make it like the sky or bright as the sun. Touch it to iron fire or put it in a bun. <laughs> in specs left and right, I prefer to wash it out. All of my pennies gone to a billion dollar industry, no doubt. Okay. And my next short poem is inspired by my wonderful family, is called Hang the Moon. Build my first bike and arrange the scope. Set the sight, hang the moon. Throw it in the pot, our little secret that Rue was always the best of the lot. Hang the moon. Stir and mix and salt and sweet. Teach me to fold that fitted sheet. Hang the moon. Color me numbers, show me words. Let me breathe wise bites and blurbs. Hang the moon. Tell me I can be anything I seek. The life you gave me, never meek. Hang the moon. So that's it. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Next up, activist, journalist, and a man who has always been a poet, Fred Dodsworth. These are all new poems written in the... Uh, last couple days, including one written today. I didn't know George Floyd. I might not have liked him, but his death broke my heart. I'm still crying. These are called mono stitches. They're just one sentence. Sandra Bland, driving through Texas, failure to signal was all it took to end Sandra Bland's life. Should I mention it was night, she was black. This is something I wrote today. It's called The Story of George and Eric. One wanted to buy some cigs. The other wanted to sell some. Both men had been targeted over and over and over again for piss ant infractions. It ended with their deaths. Every time you see me, you want to harass me, he said. They saw a black face and thought he did a crime, my mom says when they shot her son in the back twice. George and Eric didn't die from obesity or compromised health conditions. Black men die and black women die from racism, systemic police violence. We all die a bit from a culture that criminalizes living while black, a culture criminalizing trying to survive to raise a family, everything stacked against you. I can't breathe. 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 I can't breathe 11 times. It's like kneeling on a man's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. While not one officer tries to stop this murder in plain sight, but witnesses are stopped from saving a murdered man's life as it fades away right before our eyes over and over and over again. Meantime, 16-year-old Micaiah Byron gets gunned down in an instant for waving a knife. Meantime, 13-year-old Adam Toledo is given less than a second before an officer fires his gun, kills him, the boy's hands in the air, the gun that wasn't his lying there on the ground. Meantime, Tamara Rice, 12 years young, waves a toy pistol at a playground, gets shot before the patrol car stops. So don't tell me what happened. I already know. It was a lynching. And you and I are responsible for we allow this to happen every time a black man or woman dies at the hands of institutional violence codified 
justified and rationalized in the land of the free, home of the brave. And my last poem is a haiku. In these dark waters, it's easy for hope to die. We can't let hate win. Whoa. Power. Thank you, Fred. Now we have a writer of poetry, prose, scripts, and a poetic web developer, Kevin Dublin. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna just read uh, one poem, but it's a longer poem uh, in progress, mural one. It's one thing to wake in the womb of 4 a.m. darkness and know who you are. It's another when light pollution leaks city through blinds, bends to flood and to dream over before your squinted eyes. All it takes is silence to recognize a poem. Freezer motor humming becomes memory of refrigerator door closing, being told not to let your older cousin in the house. The living room carpet covered with a click of kitchen lock turning on, don't let him look around for anything valuable with at least don't drink anything after him. Sometimes it's love when reality shapes our expectations. Sometimes it's despair. Like our square park plan with a wave-like geometric play structure in an old neighborhood is sometimes a triumph and sometimes gentrification and sometimes both, all depending on who you are. Two. All it takes is silence to recognize. Outside is the hatching of morning where light is still an airy thing that purrs out past fog onto Embarcadero holding off the San Francisco Bay. Hear the pitch of laughter in a bird chirp and remember a 6 a.m. between San Diego, between conga slaps, a marble night between smokes. The stroke of beard on a runner at Brandon Station becomes the beard unkempt above a conga rim. The same curls, the same slight twist with motion, the same relaxed skin under song. How the gray patch after exhales between drags is the same gray that hangs above water. Drifts like clouds stirred on the horizon before island rain. The last time you saw it, was romantic, behind a dying firefly slipping on a tall blade of grass while pulsing, pulsing off its last light like a prayer. Three, like a reminder, this is the first year a high school girlfriend has been dead longer than she was alive, present like gray San Francisco skyline, the top of, San Fr the top, the top of Salesforce Tower, light like religion. It's human to not remember her embrace. It's human and it hurts the same way a lazy razor can remind you to pay attention in silence when you go to trim your face. The memory of all our touch will one day be replaced when skyscrapers are ancient. An empty pupil on the side of a pine tree, shadows of two birds searching for prey. Wind soothes the wet wings of an emerged monarch shaking loose and dry. What else do you find in the eye of a hunter? Antennae straighten like a mother's hand set settling her skirt before she sits. This butterfly ends half in the mouth of an oriole in flight. In a world full of husks, truth must be simple. I've never known a god who built their own temple. Four, all it takes to recognize an entire ocean to take Japanese blood moon drip to Honolulu beach, to take months, to take handmade ships, take waves, waves, take a large red light bulb with hiragana script to Tacoma, Washington shore. Somewhere there is wisdom about what we leave in the water. We are of the water and like waves may wave for a moment, but soon will be water again. Just like the rain puddle slowly giving itself up to the sky from this corner. Across 7th and Brandon at an encampment, a woman whispers, who taught you about faith? A challenge behind a tent fly sheet devoted to Soma wind. I know it is near the end, a perfect place to install a hand wash station, a porta potty. Then imagine it brown like an apple core at the base of a bush in Franklin Square Park before the week has worked on it. The murmur of worms, the shuffling skitter of cockroach feet towards frenzy. Eventually, the feeding, dazed ants stumbling from its remains, the sun-dried seed stealing away in a morning dove's beak, all it takes, the moonlight's, the moonlit stem, a tiny casket handle erupts from the earth. Five, I came from the earth, like radical seedlings work to claim March sun and say, this is my light. From the kunk of skateboard wheels over sidewalk cracks on, of Wilmington nights, head 
bobbing between headlights and behind shrubs, from lovely pines along the highway, from the taste of smoke from a backyard barbecue, from train whistles and young rumble shaking June bedroom between evening cicada songs and a radio tune to Foxy 107, 104. Like gray fox, fox squirrel, flying squirrel, white tail, deer tail that call this land home, from a father who would answer how you doing with kicking but not too high from trying to find the difference between to heal and to cure from a year of pandemic growth untwisted to locks fit together 10 years which begin with Miss Angie Oakland's finest lotician and end in hands that first braided in Senegal from the rustle of a dollar from a soup pocket into a collection plate as you brought me from a mighty long way escapes the mouth of choir from look to your neighbor and say neighbor I said, I want you to say neighbor. He brought me from a mighty long way. From Mars dust tone gleam of a street drummer skin in the sun from pattern in a mother's skirt as she leads her toddler in African dance from sun somewhere behind bay, bridge expanse and fog from the long end of a three extending beyond 60 seconds at the end of a digital clock when the police pull you over from an officer's hand over holster as a murder of crows scatter from lampposts like a dark dandelion precious pressured by exhale and summer wish. All I ask is, if he kills me, please, let there be a stranger who records him. Maybe it will be enough to go viral. Send it all to trial at least. Maybe he'll kill me and they'll judge him guilty. Maybe he'll kill me and someone will call a sentencing justice. Thank you. I felt all of that, Kevin. Thank you. Here comes New York Times best-selling author mm -hmm. and multiple award-winning poet, my friend, Mary Mackey. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm going to take you on a trip tonight since none of us have been traveling anywhere. At least, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have been dusting my car more than I've been driving it. So... <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to take you to the rainforest of Brazil because I am very, I lived in the rainforests of Central America and South America from over a period of about six years. And it's incredibly beautiful. And it's one of those great works of natural art that needs to be preserved forever and ever. And so I'm going to read you, um, what, what I'm doing in my poetry really is trying to preserve the vision for future generations of the beauty of what I'm beginning to call the old planet and also sort of talk about the, the situation. The first poem I'm going to read <clears throat> is called The Invisible Force of Amapá. And it's the least burned over cut part of the uh, Amazon. It's in Brazil. And all the animals at the beginning still exist there, but they're endangered everywhere else. Um, and so it's not, of course, invisible to the indigenous people who live there, but it's uh, not been mapped by uh, you know, anything, but they can't map it by satellite because of the trees and the clouds. That's the part of the rainforest. So. Invisible forest of Amapa, crested campuchin, nectar bat, three-toed sloth, golden lion tamarind, red-handed howling monkey, dark-throated seed eater, blue-winged macaw, Great rivers veiled in steam, 60 billion trees reaching toward a sky so green it burns like copper. Um, this next poem is from the title of my collection, The Jaguars That Prowl Our Dreams. It's the title poem. And it has a little Portuguese in it, but please don't panic because the Portuguese is uh, translated immediately after it's said. And um, also it just sort of acts as a, uh, if you don't, you know, if you understand Spanish or any romantic romance language, you'll kind of get a little extra, but it becomes a kind of chant otherwise. The first words in this poem are the tributaries of the Amazon, the great Amazon River. And the last words are the tribes that have been eliminated through genocide and disease after the European conquest. So this is called the Jaguars that Prowl Our Dreams. Up on the Orinoco, Rio Negro, Solimoish, Tokan Xing, Xingu, Javare. They're drinking the bebida preta, black drink, snake vine, ayahuasca, yage, blood of the great anaconda, with the smoke of burning rainforests in their nostrils, and ugosto de cenizas, taste of ashes on their tongues. Eles está comendo, they're eating purple snails, 
powdered viper venom, largatas esmagadas, flowers that dry their lips the color of blood, singing of cities of blue glass and the jaguars that prowl our dreams. Uke mice, what else are they seeing? Uke mice, what else do they know? They're not saying, they're not telling. They're calling on the ghost tribes instead. Ghosts of the Tupanimba, Tupanking, Amare, lost up river, forever lost in the burning world. And then I'm gonna read you one more poem. Um, and this is a poem, we were just talking earlier about the joy of Zoom, bringing people together from all over the world and being able to see one another uh, with no barriers, which is one of the good things about Zoom. And this is sort of about the, a poem about, you know, universe, universal energy and the joy of that universal energy. And it's called Samba. Samba, Samba. It's always been Samba. The ferns in the window Samba toward the light. The squash blossoms in the garden Samba open. And the cucumber vines Samba up the wall. In the high grass, the crickets are singing Samba and the quail are in a circle stamping their feet. The cabbage moths Samba and the yellow jacket Samba and even the snail Samba very, very slowly. And in the orc cloud, Hail Bop is doing the Samba, twitching her long argon skirts. At the edge of the universe at this very moment, billions of nameless galaxies are sambaing away from one another at the speed of light. Back on earth, people samba to work and samba home and their dogs and cats samba out to greet them. Lovers samba all night long in samba happy beds and newborn babies dream of nothing but samba. Even the dead samba into the ground and samba back out again, leaving empty spaces where the samba goes on doing its own samba forever. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Always delightful. Love it. Next up is poet, playwright, publisher, and founder of Hayward B Street Writers, my fellow B Streeter, Leticia Garcia Bradford. You're on mute. Hi there. Thank you, Cheryl. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I've got several poems for you. The first one is St. Michael in the Garden. I can't remember me swinging. Is mama pushing me? Finally on my own, afraid to swing too high. In junior high, stealing the seat from a kid with a heart of disillusionment. St. Michael in the Garden. I can't remember the thorn in my side, like a pebble in my shoe. Why is it there? A rose has thorns, even so it is beautiful. St. Paul has a thorn, questioning the same as mine. He endures the pain, I cannot. St. Michael in the garden. I can't remember my first love, that first kiss. Was it filled with love or infatuation? That kiss led to sex, that led to a baby, crying for love. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. St. Michael in the garden. Guardian in front of my ill-driven cart, I strive for peace, for comfort, for strength. The sorrow that encapsulates me needs a deeper root, needs the great sunshine, needs the water of life. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. St. Michael speaks to me. Thank you. Um, the second um, poem I have for you tonight was um, kind of inspired by um, AWP from 2019, no, 2018. And I went to a workshop and this poem is called um, Out of Grasp. I try hard to overcome hurdles fast approaching, yet in every sense of the word, I feel like a failure, getting closer to the prize before it slips away. Buy that lottery ticket full of hope, fingers crossed, pinching pennies to pay the rent, swinging high, but not high enough to release all my troubles. 
running to catch the bus, watching it go by the bus stop, a mere 500 meters away, grasping a beautiful rose, pricking my fingers, luscious plump berries hiding behind a cave of thorns, extending my hand toward ripe fruit on the tree, avocado, apricots, pomegranates, the card breaking down before my next paycheck, speed reading the library book, finishing after due date. Are late fees a sin? Needing more drugs to stave off depression. I feel like I'm running behind the pack. I wake up each day to start anew. I put a smile on my face to fake it. All my insecurities and woes put into a bottomless pot, shoved up high on the shelf, yet still within reach. Why can't my uncertainties be out of grasp? Does the imposter syndrome ever find a cure? <laughs> and I could keep reading poetry the rest of the night, but I'll finish up with this one. Um, it seems of late, my grandsons have been my muse. And this particular one was a photograph I got of my year and a half old grandson finding his shadow for the first time. <laughs> This is called My Fleeting Shadow. Flying above the morning dawn, I'm looking for my shadow. Not yet do I perceive what often eludes me. I'm searching for the sky amongst the clouds up above. I look for dandelions to blow sweet seeds across the horizon. Is it green or is it cold? Is it red, real or is it memorex? You can't compare. Must be an echo. Worship, worship, worship. The wheels are turning on a dry ocean. The dregs of sand fill my casket. I feel like a fish on land. Take me home to Atlantis and back again. What's real, what's not real, I cannot find it. I'm still looking for my shadow. Below the deep, come with me and fly upon the sea. I've been there before. Worship, worship, worship. Holding grandma's shriveled hand, fingernails perfect. That's all I have left of her. Holding baby's tiny finger, tiny hand holding fast my pinky. Grip with the memory, it may never be there again. Worship, worship, worship. The Bradford stained glass window in, town of, in the town of York in Great Britain. My sanctuary shattered in the war. Poppers pulled their pennies together to rebuild the cathedral window. Is it real? Is it replaced? Is it refurbished? Yes, the sun shines through again, as does my shadow. Worship, worship, worship. The sky is green, the glass is blue. My memory fulfills despite my fleeting shadow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Leticia. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, get ready for the sublimely creative mother, dancer, singer, writer, and poet, Isis Blanchette Marceline. Good evening, good evening, everybody. I'm super excited to be with you all, everybody that has signed in. It's wonderful. I'm gonna just jump right on in. I have uh, three pieces that I'd like to share tonight. And this first one is called Bullet uh, Shinkansen, which is the Japanese bullet train. Now boarding. I'm not getting on that thing, supersonic spring fling. I heard it causes, causes motion sickness in the morning. I heard it drops you off in the wrong part of town. Sparing me a ticket does not make me frown. I said, I'm not getting in that trap. The door shut behind me like a fact. What if I never get back? Who else is in the cabin? What concoctions of drinks do they be having? The engines are loud. I, I can't hear a thing not even my own inner voice as it whispers and sings. 
The horn keeps blaring, a stentorian sound. Have we even started moving? Are we still on the ground? So many voices, yet no other passengers around. The dining car's bar is fully stocked and loaded, an endless flow of the perfect cocktails to get me bloated. Berries with the chocolate coating. <clears throat> Who else is here? My one frustration is how did I even get to the station? <laughs> Departing. Let's check out the head car. The conductor must be near. What? There's no one here. Come to notice I'm all alone. Except you, there in the rear. Where are we going? What shall we do? And if no one's driving this thing, are we through? Ah. All right. <laughs> so this next one is called Iceberg, um, 868. And it's a really famous iceberg that it's just uh, melted away. Iceberg. Only the tip, sometimes, when the sun is hot enough, I drip. But thaw, I, never. I'm much too clever. See, most of me is beneath the sea, cloaked, executioner of boats. Don't float. Don't mistake me for land. No, it's frozen quicksand. Paralytic frigidity, Poseidon can't get rid of me. Shiver me timbers, brisk, crisp, and quivers, embossed in scabrous shards. Primitive wounds bleed, tar. Alone amongst the vastness, the mind wanders the fastest, the silent flickers above, no arms to hug. Deep and thick, impenetrable and slick, Faithful to fusion with the floor, down further evermore. Mammoth breadth and an abysmal depth where light ends and darkness bends. The interplaners permeate the channels with the gates that usually stay locked. See, permafrost's usually a solid block. But the detonation of fire ice, primordial density gutted, sliced, geysers spewing diamonds, smelting into glitter dust, disclosure of my hidden trust, gushing into the void, the blue, molten sleeted magma, my form, new, compressing so until you wouldn't let go. <laughs> All right, this last one is called Wet Boots, Mater Dei. I hate soggy socks, especially when I know it's gutter water. We trod along the slippery sidewalk. The umbrella barely covers the both of us. Watch out for puddles. Don't want to get your socks muddy. I ache. My baby doesn't have galoshes. Just his regular tennis. I got wet boots. I thought they'd protect me in the rain. Turns out they have holes. With every step, I squish and squash in the sloppy feel. Toes cold and wrinkled. As long as my baby doesn't know, I'm good. I get him to class, dry enough. He won't be the only damp child in class. And I just hope the kindergarten carpets don't mildew. Hmm, I'm sure I sh there's something else I could be thinking about. What do I do while he's away for three and a half hours? That's just enough time for me to, hmm. I carry myself back up 6th Street and mother calls to me. Sometimes I listen, 
Other times I don't. Today though, I figure, well, my boots are already soaked. My little piggy's pruning. I might as well go talk to her. The gates to the courtyard seem to always be open. Angels cry unto the flowers placed delicately amongst mother. She's holding her baby God. Umbrella collapses from my hand, blows away a few feet. And as usual, I kneel before her and I bless her and the child and their everlasting love, grace, and mercy. Before I continue pouring like the sky above, she silences us. Listen, she says something to me. Before long, I open my eyes and I wash my face. I hope I don't forget what mother said. I, although honestly, I hope I was quiet enough to hear her. I start thinking of all the ways I'm going to dry my feet. Maybe I'll prop them in front of the heater. Maybe I'll put on another pair of socks. Should I throw these boots away? I mean, they're still fine when it's not raining. Ooh, I wish I had a blow dryer. They'd be toasty in seconds. <laughs> I make it back home and take off my wet boots. My socks and feet are dry. Thank you all. Ah. Marvelous debut, Isis. Thank you. Well, there is one more poet left. Let's see, who is it? Oh, it's me. No poetry, no peace. It can saunter serenely, press its form against any door of any room. Enter on a vapor trace, hijacking my senses, taking over my everything. Yet much of the time, it knocks hard on my wall of sleep interrupted, slapping my rim into wide-eyed recognition that another one has arrived, compelling me to rise, to speak it before it's gone, write it before it is erased. But I turn my pillow to the cool side and seek slumber's return, leaving open the door to a morning of regret, a day of clumsy attempts to reach back and get the right words in the right order, in the right rhythm. So many times I foolishly let it sleep away, dreaming myself good enough to retrieve it all intact in my chaotic wakefulness with original meaning, thinking I would repossess it easily with my anointed poetic compass, even as it warned in whisper there will be war within and conflict unresolved. I will scatter you if you do not find me. No poetry, no peace. I awake and still believe the prose of the dream is tucked away and easy to wave returned by the magic wand of the bard. But that is the lie of the fantasy. As sunrise scorches recall, I mourn another disappearance to the toss and the turn, to the burning wet skin, to this false strength of memory, this confidence of divine recollection, this fear that if I rise, I will have to explain why I am up at this hour and I will have to reveal a poem is here. I must let it in, no poetry, no peace. It doesn't give up on me an unrelenting surprise. I do believe it loves me. Another has arrived, compelling me to rise, to speak it before it's gone, to write it before it is erased. No poetry, no peace. Now I am loud with it. I know the consequences of an abuse of power. It will all be said, whether you ever hear it or not. I am a soldier in this war a self-appointed prose protector. From those who live without the reason and the rhyme and can be prone to evil, no poetry, no peace. I did not know it would make me feel this way, 
So I do not hesitate on those nights more frequent now. I am duty bound to trap it and assure its capture so I can set it free. I write in the dark. On paper, I can only feel with my hands purposely spacing the lines much too far apart so there are no misunderstandings. While the armor of urgency shields each movement and the words fall out with the hope that clarity is still present in the next. And somehow I know all will be well. I have kept the night safe. There will be another morning. I have once again completed my ordered contribution against the tide of damage caused by the missing poem in the no verse Badlands, where punishment is swift when words are not used as intended, leaving space for alternatives that lack compassion and grace and diminish the woman who ignores the message of her muse. No poetry, no peace. Thank you all for being here. Thank you poets. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Mechanics Institute. It's been a pleasure. You're very welcome and thank you all for the uh, stunning work. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you have questions, please put them in the chat space and I'll read them out aloud. All right, what they seem to wanna to know is where to buy the books. Um, so I put the link to the events, tonight's website, uh, tonight's events website, um, and there you'll find the reader's bios that they provided to me. Some of their bios have links directly to uh, the poet's um, private websites where you can buy materials from them. I also encourage you to uh, reach out to your local bookstore and ask them to order the book that you are interested in. But it sounds as if a lot of these poems were new. Is that true, readers, poets? <laughs> well, mine are in my book, No Poetry, No Peace. And it's available, Goodreads, Amazon. Um, just go to www.sherljbizet-boutet.com and you'll find the links. Yeah, mine aren't new, mine are in my collection, uh, The Jaguars That Prowl Our Dreams. And this can be found, I would like you to buy it from your local bookstore, they can order it. It should be easily ordered from Marsh Hawk Press. But you can also, or a small press distribution actually is where you should order it. But it also can be found on Amazon and um, all my books actually can be. So, uh, you know, if you can't, if you're somewhere out in the country where you have no local bookstore, that's a good alternative. But it's always great to support your local bookstores. It's really important for all of us and for every for the culture of poetry itself. So. Here, here. For me, uh, most of my poems are on my blog. And if you Google my name, Letitia Garcia Bradford, it will pop up all kinds of things. And you should be able to get to, I have two blogs, lbradford.blogs, I think dot blog dot blogspot I don't dot com I think I haven't looked at it in so long but I also have another blog too of some of my stories so um my shadow poem I just wrote with a broken arm how do you write with a broken arm so it's not anywhere yet thank you that sounds like a poem Leticia how do you but write the, with a broken arm it's, it's a long process but I figured it out <laughs> good Um, okay, so I was able to get Leticia and Cheryl's websites on in the chat space. Kevin also has a website. There we go. I spend most of my time actually making books for other poets. And so I'm going to put uh, in the chat the moms for housing book that just came out by colossus press that i put together which cheryl's got work in and, and it's a beautiful one of the most beautiful books i have ever seen and i just finished working with um uh, with uh, carla bundridge to put uh put together dante uh dante clark's closed calf cat coffins which is a fantastic book by the poet laureate of 
former poet laureate of Richmond about Richmond life. And uh, wow. it's it's so good. Um, the Colossus Press one for Moms for Housing, all the money, every cent of it goes to the Moms for Housing. So uh, they bought the houses in Oakland uh, that were being uh, taken off the market. So that's one of these days I'll get one of my own books out. But right now I'm working on four or five other books for other people. <laughs> And if any of the poets here today, y'all know who to talk to. <laughs> yeah, here's here's uh, here's uh, the the Moms for Housing, um, the Colossus Press Home. Goes so they can buy another house every cent. Fred has some beautiful work in here. <laughs> Thank you, Isis or Angela. Do you have any um, web links that you want me to push, put in the chat? At this time, well, we can. Um, I tend to mooch off of my mom a bit, so we can go to her website first. Um, my, I'm a scientist, uh, so I spend most of my time doing that. But, uh, but yeah, you can find my stuff at my mom's website for now. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, well, let's see. Thank you very much, everyone. I don't see any. Any questions here? Oh, there's ISIS's website in the chat. And um, those of you who are attending, uh, when I have the video ready, I'll also include these links again in the email that I send you. So um, don't stress out about making sure that you copy these because I'll send them to you in a, in a day or two. Um, all right, thank you, poets. Uh, you made yeah, my- One more thing, Taryn. Yes. Uh, if you all, if everyone liked what they heard tonight and they want to hear it again, contact Taryn. Yeah. Contact me. Contact Taryn. <laughs> <laughs> and right to hear more, not, not again, but if you want to hear more, mm -hmm. let Taryn know. Yes, absolutely. If you, if you are a poet or if you're a writer of some kind and you have some other writer friends and you want to have a reading of some kind like this let me know and um and we'll see what we can we can figure out together and i will put my chat um not my chat but my email address in the chat space as well so you have it and all right kevin, kevin was the curator that just put together the quiet lightning reading which will be on may 3rd so if you want to hear more about what kevin help birth, check out quietlightning.com. May 3rd, there will be a reading. Right on, good, good, good. Good to know. Thank you again, uh, Taryn. Thank you, poets. I think Kevin wants to say something, I think. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, you know, for ever mentioning that to uh, Cheryl, I, you know, everyone, all the readers, fantastic, Taryn, um, you know, amazing is always putting this uh, all together. But yeah, no, thank you everyone also for coming. Cheryl, thank you so much. Taryn, thank you so much. All the readers, thank you so much. You guys rock my world. No poetry. No, no peace. peace. Thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Cheryl. This has been a great pleasure and nice mm. to meet some new poets. And mm -hmm. I'd like to hear you more from all of you in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a nice evening. Good night. Good night. Bye, Bye. everybody.